I'm, yeah, like you just said, CEO of a local software company here. Is that for me? <laughs> oh, great, thanks. That, that, that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk today about uh, data versioning, snapshot of data versioning. Uh, but before I, I dive into that, uh, I'm going to talk about kind of the bigger picture of why we're, why we're building what we're building and um, kind of the, the motivation. And to do that, it's going to take a big step back and take a look at the industry. Um, it's, a, it's a grand act of, of hubris to try to describe the software industry. You know, all stories are just one story. You know, every, all stories are false in a sense. But we've got one and we're, we're going to take a crack at it. So um, here it goes. So once upon a time, there were no end users of software. There was uh, computers that had existed for, for decades, but, but the, they were only ac accessible by highly skilled technicians who were um, you know, considered kind of the wizards of the day. Uh, it might sound a little bit familiar uh, when we fast forward to today and our role in the industry. Um, but yeah, they, they weren't accessible by end users, and, and even that idea that computers w would have a place in a, a normal person's life was a, was a radical... Is that going to keep happening? I get a blue light in my face when that comes on. Um, well, whatever. Okay, so, um, right, the, the, that users could use a computer was a radical idea at the time. Um, and then, of course, you know, we know the history everybody does. The, back in the, the, the late 70s, um, these, these crazy people, these radical people, had this idea of, of personal computing, that, that a person could use a computer in their life. And um, that idea at the time was met with great skepticism, actually. You know, company, there's all these great quotes about... Uh, you know, how much RAM will be enough. Well, there's some great quotes about, about why people will never need to use a computer. Um, but history, of course, proved them right. And we fast forward to today, and what we see is that, you know, computers, everybody uses computers. It's, it's become an essential part of being a human today. Um, so that transition from the early, early 70s, or the late 70s, and the advent of personal computing to today, um, when we look at it, we see a, a progressing line of things, a kind of a gradient of things that, that end users can do that um, that computers have been able to do for a long time. You know, iconic examples include uh, like uh, desktop publishing, right? Where where before computers, before desktop publishing, computers had been producing documents for a long time, but they used you know languages like LaTeX and uh, and. <laughs> <laughs> th th things that, that things that were far from accessible by end users being the point. Not that there's anything wrong with LaTeX; it's actually a really <laughs> kind of cool format, but but uh, but it's you know far from accessible. Um, and and we see this all over the place. You know, the capacity to email, right? Computers have been able to send messages to each other for a really long time, but but now on our iPhone, you can you can hardly make a mistake. It's so, it's so easy. Um, text without it. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, so we look at that, and, and we've come so far, and yet, yet there's still a divide between, between the, the users and, um, and the, uh, the, the producers and the consumers. Actually, I'm, I'm going to use these. The producers and the consumers of software. Um, oh, yeah, right. Uh, personal computing. These are old slides, and, and what I want to demo today is largely technical, but these are they're relevant to this part of it. Um, right, so, so we're, the, we're the intercessors to the power of computing. We play this role as gatekeeper. And considering how much uh, computers have changed our world, that role, I don't think, you know, it's, we, we all look at it, and we don't really talk about it very much, that, that our role is, is kind of the gatekeeper to the power of, of computing, and the power of computing is transforming our world. It's absolutely fundamentally changing what it means to be a human from what it meant, you know, 30 years ago. Um, the way we interact, our social interactions, our, our, our commerce structures, you know, the, the whole thing. And, it, and, I, and I believe it's, it's, you know, Larry Ellison says, the digital revolution is over and everybody should go to bioinformatics, right? And I say, we have the, we're the model T era of the, of the digital revolution. We barely started. Um, 
So this role as, uh, uh, as intercessor to the power of computing is uh, a big, I'm not gonna say it's a problem because to say it's a problem means to say it's bad, but, but it's, it's important I think to look at, at what might be possible if it didn't exist. And uh, you know, um, we create users, uh, we create software for our, our users on their behalf. Um, and uh, that means that, that uh, you know, they're the domain experts. And, and for, the, for us to create software for our clients, we have to understand their world. And it's, it's this knowledge transfer that, that has to happen. And you know, in, in consumer uh, apps, software's pretty good these days. It's pretty easy to use, but you, you dive into the enterprise and what you find, in my experience, is that everybody hates their software. Because, because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a custom solution that 60 people use, that, that somebody produces, and there, has, there isn't this profound pressure to, to make a really nice user experience. It's make something that'll work so we can run our, run our company. And, um, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a, these users, they can imagine how to fix this software, but they can't fix it themselves. And so it's, it's a bottleneck to creativity and in, innovation. Um, it's a disincentive to change. Um, and this, this is Darwin, by the way, where, where like, you know, when we embrace uh, software the way we do, it becomes the nervous system of our organization. And it, it, really, it really defines what our organization, organization does in a lot of ways. For many companies that you know, simply could not exist without their software. And it's historically unprecedented that a, a CEO can't just show up at a company and say, today we're gonna do it like this, right? We've been doing it like this forever, but today we're gonna do it like this. We're just gonna go try something new. That, 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 capacity to do that has been deeply inhibited by the way that we've embraced software. Because it's like, today we're gonna to tell the programmers to do it like this, and then six weeks or six months or six years later, you know, we're gonna have it done, and then we're gonna try it out. And if it doesn't work, well, shit, we just spent $50,000 or 500, whatever, right, on all this, on all, trying it this new way. And, uh, and, and then when, when an organization has to change, um, you know, Darwin talks about this at the biological level, like, like when, an organi organism, when an organism has to change, their, their survival, the, 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 the fitness of an or organism is its capacity to adapt to that change. Not, not its strength in the moment, but inevitably there will be a sudden change and that capacity to adapt to that change is what um, determines fitness, like whether we survive or not. And the way we as a species have embraced computer technology, I believe, has d disincentivized change and that, and that it's a massive liability for our, for our species. Um, so, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a wonderful opportunity, right, to, to make things better. So, what would it look like if programming was easy? That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, it'd be a huge opportunity, uh, it'd be an explosion of creativity and innovation. It would empower end users to organize and collaborate in, in ways that, that they can't right now. Um, and, and you know, how many how many times have you heard this? Oh, I've got this great idea for an app, right? Uh, that, that somebody has, and then you know, they don't have 50 grand to go and, and find developers to do it. Well, if that bottle, if that, if that barrier ever came down, um, I think we would see an explosion of, of a certain type of applications um, because when you look at what it takes to create software today, it takes either skill or money. And um, not everybody has those things. And those that do, you know, have largely driven the digital revolution. And what would it look like for the disempowered to be able to make software, for the disempowered to uh, be able to change the world in the ways that they would like to versus the ways that, you know, big companies would like to? Um, I think it would open some doors and I think it would make the world a better place. Uh, not to quote Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
So, so this is not a new goal. People have been trying to empower end users for a, for, for a long time to create software. Hypercard, Logo, Scratch, Lego Mindstorms. Do you know that Python was actually intended to be an end user uh, programming environment uh, when, when it started? It was, it was targeted at end users to be a... Was it? They used to say that every business person would be able to write their own programs in COBOL. Yeah, SQL yeah. was too, that's right. You know, the, why is that not up here? Um, it, it, SQL is like a, it's simple query language, right? Yeah. Where it's just, oh, it's just like English. You just write it up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, VisiCal, the first killer app, I still think spreadsheets are like the coolest end user programming environment. Um, people do amazing things with spreadsheets. Uh, my friend over at the Department of Health and Welfare, he, uh, um, Oracle's coming in, man, I'm really crapping on Oracle today. Oracle was coming in uh, to, to put in this $900,000 system to renovate their, their stuff, right? And he can, like, I can do this all in spreadsheets. This is so easy. And, and did it and proved it and took it to his boss. And they're like, well, but that doesn't follow within our blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, it wasn't a robust piece of software, but it, it proves he wasn't a computer programmer. He was just an untrained power user who was making software that, that, that functioned with the same function as, as a million dollar system, right? And, and it proves that there's, there's an opportunity there. There's a, there's a bottleneck in that a lot of people are smart enough. Like, we didn't invent all this shit. Like, like databases and, boot and logic, classification and logic, all these things, these are not things that we as computer programmers invented. I think that's what we forget that sometimes. That, like, uh, we, we emulated them out of the real world, you know? So, um, anyway, so, this is, so we're working on a system that, like, like many before us, empowers end users to create software. I think our, our approach is a little bit unique. Um, it is free, open source, decentralized, web-based, and user programming environment. And it's not in open source entirely yet. We've taken the parts. Like, it doesn't really make sense as a whole. Um, I, I mean, it doesn't make sense in parts. What, what am I trying to say? There are, there are things that we have developed that are general purpose. Uh, and I'm going to show you one of those today. And then the rest really work within each other to create a system that, that is targeted at, at end users, and the intent is for all of it to be open source, but right now we're just taking the things that are generally useful and open source those. Um, so, what's our approach? What, how, why are we doing this, and why am I talking about this to a database group, right? Well, um, we start with first principles. Uh, this is a great quote from Elon Musk, um, which says, I think it's important to, to reason from fir first principles rather than by analogy. The normal way we conduct our lives is we reason by analogy. We're doing this because it's, it's like something else that was done, or it, it's like what other people are doing. Slight, iteration, slight iterations on a theme. First principles is a physics way of looking at the world. What that really means is that you boil things down to the most fundamental truths and then reason from there. So our first principle is classification and distinction, which um, I'm going to talk about it philosophically, but you'll probably already know what it, what it is in the real world, which is, is data. But classification and distinction is um, a way of organizing, of making sense of the world that says, we put things in, the, in a category that are all the same. Like all, all of you are all the same. Because, you know, w w we can say, why are you the same? Well, you're all people, and you're all Postgres users, and you're all on and on and on, right? And then distinction is, is all of you are different. And, you know, all these chairs are different, all, all these, you know, uh, man, there's no stuff in this room. Usually I can point to some stuff, but it's just completely empty. <laughs> all these lights are, are, are the same, but they're all different, right? Um, and that sameness and differentness, sameness and differentness, sameness but differentness, is, uh, I believe, like the fundamental way that we make sense of the world. Um, it's something that animals do. You know, when, a, when an animal is, is uh, scared of, uh, of horses or scared of men with hats, right? Because they were beaten by a man with a hat. It's because, you know, they learned that that category of things is, is a threat. And uh, um, so that in, in, their, uh, in their schema, in their database, in their head of people, they have a has hat boolean, right? And, <laughs> and they equate it with danger. And, and so, um, right. Classification and distinction is so fundamental to making sense of the world. I think it is how we make sense of the world. 
um, at least a big part of it. So uh, let's see. Here's a Lego block, the lowly Lego block. Um, classification and distinction on this, uh, right? The um, the first layer is what is a Lego block, uh, and then the second a Lego block is you know it's this plastic thing, and their Lego blocks are all the same. They're made they're all made out of plastic. They all have bumps on the top and holes in the bottom. Um, and then how is a Le one Lego block different from another? These are the fields across the, you know, they've got an ID which identifies it, the color, a length, a, and a width. Um, and then you, you notice that we've been talking about Lego blocks this, this, this whole time, but we, but we haven't described any particular Lego block. It's all about the nature of what it means to be a Lego block in, the, in this frame. Um, and then what are the properties of this specific Lego block? That, now we're talking about data. Data describes the world. Um, and so, on and on and on. Right, here we go. <laughs> well, what if, I, what if I told you, right, that classification and distinction can model just about anything. And so we, we identify it as a first principle and, and build up from there. Um, so as a first principle, we have to come back and reassess what it means to be a programmer from this place of first principle. And uh, we ask the question, how do we model our tools as programmers as data using classification and distinction? Um, and so we start with, you know, the thing about Postgres is, and, and you know, all databases is that that's what they do. They are mechanisms for storing classifications and distinctions. You know, and but sort of set, set theory is another way to frame what they are. Um, but uh, uh, we chose Postgres. Um, yeah, right, on the back of an elephant because it's freaking awesome. And I've been working intensely with, with Postgres for the last I mean, we, we used it in the enterprise under, underneath Django in the back of the closet for, for years, but, we, but like, we've really dove into what it can do in the last two and a half years, and our, I couldn't love a piece of technology more than I love Postgres. I'm just in awe of this project, and we discover new things it can do all the time. Um, so this is the database. Uh, the, if, you, if you throw it up you know, as a pie, you can break it into three different pieces of pie. The data manipulation language, DDL uh, is data definition language. That's your schema create, create table, create schema, all that stuff. Um, and we also include in there all the other uh, stuff that Postgres does that isn't necessarily data, de which you wouldn't call data definition language, but like uh, foreign tables, right? You guys all, who knows what a foreign table is? Foreign data wrapper. A foreign data wrapper, yeah. Um, we would include that in there too. Then data manipulation, DML is data manipulation language, and that is, um, you know, the changing of data. And then DQL is, is the, the modification, or the, the querying, the reading of data, and reading and, and recombining of data. So um, the first part of this system is a writable system catalog. Okay, what does that mean? It is, um, who knows what the system catalog is? Yeah, everybody knows. All right, it's a Postgres group, right? Uh, the system catalog, in case that everybody doesn't know, is, is the thing that makes the database look like data. You can you can select from the tables table, and there's actually two of them. There's the uh, there's the Postgres one, uh, which is called PG catalog, and then the other one called Information Schema, uh, which is an ANSI standard, which was I believe added on after. Yes, definitely added on after. It actually queries the system catalog, but um, we wanted to make one that was uh, writable, one that was kind of normalized. If you look at both of those, th those two sy existing system catalogs, I mean, in my opinion, they're kind of a mess. The, the, uh, the naming conventions, and, and it, one has the baggage of Postgres before it was even an SQL database. Not that it's baggage, but it's just like, it's pretty internal. It's kind of the internal representation. And then the other one's an ANSI standard, or ASCII standard, I forget, but some standard, the information schema, which is also laid out just kind of weird. Like, I want a table called tables, and I want a, a table called columns, and I want a table called schema, and, and just all the stuff, the way that we talk about it and the way that we think about it. Um, so we made our own. And uh, what it does is it lets you, um, 
look at the look at the system. I can actually demo this, it, uh, but you get the idea. It lets you look at look at what's going on. You see that it's made out of views, and those views underneath the hood they query um, the system catalog. But there's one called tables, and you just select star from tables, and what you get is all the tables. But the cool thing about it is that you can foreign key into it, and you can update it. Um, it's not not exactly foreign key. We invented a type system. Um, this is not the, the, the point of my talk, but I'll just survey this because we, you have to know a little bit about it to know how we did the data versioning. Um, we had invented a type system called, where there's things called table ID, right, where, where it, it uh, can reference a table by name, and um, column ID and that kind of thing. And then you can, in, you can do stuff like a, like a insert into table, um, and then the, the values of it are like are like name, you know, and name and, and uh, yeah, that, that'd be basically it. And it'll it'll create a table from that. So so it's a writable system catalog. And to revisit our first principle, what that means is is that uh, we've made the database so that you can manipulate it as if it was data. Um, it means it means that in theory, all you would ever have to do with this write writable system catalog is insert, update, and delete. You can do all the stuff that Postgres can do by only doing inserts, updates, and deletes. Um, and that's, that's the theoretical goal of it. Now, have we achieved that? No, not entirely. There's all kinds of stuff that Postgres does that was like, well, is that really that important for our needs? Not super important. We're not gonna do security barriers, right? You can't insert a security barrier, but, but uh, maybe someday we'd like to. You know, full coverage would be great. But, okay, so does that make sense? Does everybody understand what, that, what we're talking about so far? Any questions? Hello. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. Let's see here, where are we? All right. So, set search path equal to meta. Um, and slash D, D. All right, slash DV. So we've, we've implemented, implemented this three times. Once as views, then we did it as tables, uh, like which are materialized, um, and that was a huge disaster. I mean, it, it wasn't a disaster, but like to keep it in sync with the reality, uh, you have to have full cover DDL trigger coverage, and we used the new DDL triggers, which were awesome, but it just became unwieldy and, and unreliable. So we went back to views um, and did some other stuff. But okay, so select. Star, you see what we have here on the screen? This, can everybody see that? A little bigger? Yes. Okay, so this is the stuff that we have coverage of in, in the database. Uh, there's views and triggers and tables and schemas and roles and relations and functions, foreign keys, constraints, uh, connections. Connections is one of my favorite. That's everybody who's connected to the database. And then you can go in and delete one of those connections and it'll kick them out. <laughs> Uh, select star from connection, right? Whoops. Connection, right? Um, and you see that I'm the only person connected right now. Uh, and that, that gets really, that's too small. How do I, how do I describe a view? That's way too small. Uh, ah. What the hell? I don't know what happened here. Okay, select star from table. We call them table or tables. Tables. Oh, right. Uh, we call them relations, because um, that, that way then select star from relation. Uh, so what you see here is an identifier, a schema ID, a schema name, uh, the, name the name of the table, et cetera. Uh, there we go. Primary, is it, does it, what's its primary key? Um, 
and then so on and so forth. Okay, select star from uh, function. And that is terrible. How do I, uh, slash d, v, plus? Uh, set, uh, you set format rack. P set format. Oh, it's the semicolon, you're right. Oh, that's why. Okay, got it. Okay. Slash dv roll. And is it dv plus? How do I show the fields on view? Slash d plus. Slash d plus roll. There we go. Okay, so, um, you know, here's a view, or a roll rather. What you see is, is it a super user? Can I inherit from... Um, does it inherit? I forget what that one one is. Uh, these booleans are its permissions, you know. Then there's its password, so I can select star from role, and you see there's only two roles: Postgres and space space. Um, and then these are the values. But now, if I want to create a user, I can insert into role, uh, and then on and on and on, and it will create a user. I'm not going to type it all out right now, but. Um, it's an it's you know it's an example of uh, of the, you see these triggers down here. Uh, what the triggers do is is create cr go and create the role. It's view triggers. So um, yeah, that's the system catalog. Does that does that all make sense? Okay, so that's our layer, our architecture layer one. And I'm going to go back to my slides now. So you're making the creation of the structure consistent with the manipulation. Of Exactly. There's a word for that. It's called homo iconicity or something like that. Um, it's, and the, the only database I know of that actually does this isn't actually a database at all, but it's RDF. RDF where you, uh, oh. there's the class of classes and the, uh, uh, you know, properties are in the class of properties and it's all super meta and gets super weird and hard to work with, but, um, uh, but still pretty cool. Okay. It's good. a cool idea if they had anybody who was willing to pull their storage for it. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, a, uh, a better query language and all that. But, um, okay. Layer two is, is grammar. I'm not going to talk about this a ton, but, but uh, basically what the grammar does, the SQL layer does, is it takes SQL and we build out an abstract syntax tree for SQL as, as tables in a database. And that means that you can then write inserts to, the, to, this, uh, to these tables, and what they do is produce SQL statements. There's a, there's a parser in there and a two string in there to, to go in, in and out. And so you can then manipulate uh, a SQL statement through inserts and updates. And it's cumbersome as hell you know, to do. Of course, as a user, you'd much prefer to type the SQL out. But that's not what we were going for. We, we were going for... Um, like granular manipulation of SQL so that, so that you can build a user interface against it. The, the really cool thing about this first principle is that when you make everything in the stack look like data, then what, then what you're doing is creating, creating programs and creating queries and, and ma managing the database using only inserts, updates, and deletes. And what that means is that we can write applications against it so that <coughs> the user interface is decoupled from the, uh, from the model, the data model. And so, so you can experiment with the user interface and try all kinds of different user interfaces. And yet under the hood, all they're doing is manip manipulating data. And we've been doing uh, user interfaces that manipulate data for ever. I mean, that's what we all do all day as, I like, guess, web programmers anyway. If you're a web programmer, that's what you do. You make user interfaces that manipulate data. So it, it takes all that massive amount of expertise that we have at that pattern and it points it at end user programming so that, so that we can now make user interfaces. And I'm going to jump to a demo of that real quick. That, uh, um, so this is a query editor. And let's go to demo. What you see right here is that uh, 
is hard to hard to hard to show. I go full screen with this. Uh, what you get is this uh, bi-directional relationship between code up here and this user interface right here. What this is is a user, user interface. Then you, you got your manipulators down here and then the results down at the bottom. But what this does is, is let you um, turn one of those on and off. And you see what happened there? Take a look at that query when I click this. Boop. And it pops the boat.b name in there going back and forth. And now let's take this limit and change it to a 2. And you see that it changes up there and the, and the results change. Um, so you get this bi-directional relationship between code and user interface. And what's happening underneath the hood here is this is arcane. You guys got to check this out. Uh, whoops. Uh, man, what's going on here? Oh, SQL simple, right. Okay, so this is the abstract syntax tree of SQL. So what you have in here <laughs> is like that you can uh, select star from, uh, I gotta just pick one of these. So let's dive into uh, from clause. So what's a from clause? Well, it's a, a join statement list followed by a table expression. Um, and we could go in, into this, but what this is basically is the, the internals of the, the SQL grammar represented as tables in a database. And so to build a user interface against this, oh, I want to make a join, I just insert a couple fields into this thing, and then it reproduces the whole thing, and you can run the two string, and on and on and on. So, oh, shoot. Ah! Confounded machines. And, yep. Okay, so does that all make sense? Okay, so, so the, the big first principle here, I'm going to say it one more time because it's the most important concept I'm going to try and get across today, which is that uh, when you make everything data, you can make user interfaces for it, and we're really good at that. So, so this is taking, the, the goal is to take the entire programming stack, make it look like data, and then kind of crowdsource the, the, the creation of user interface for it so that we can just like, create this swirling abyss of different approaches to user interfaces and try them and then they won't work and some will work and some people will work, some will work great for kids and some will work great for old people and, and, and blind people and, and whatever. And yet underneath the hood is this really nice data model that is consistent and all these, all these user interfaces can coexist and work against this data model. So, that's what we're up to at Aquameta. We've been working on this for about, about two years now. And um, it's been like my passion for over a decade um, to, to try and bring this thing into reality. And we, we, we worked on this big contract. It was uh, five years long. We saved up a bunch of money and then we spent it all on this. And now we're broke. And everybody, everybody like had to take the summer off and uh, uh, we're maybe looking for venture capital or something like that, but what's probably going to happen is we're just going to open source it and um, like the whole thing, even though it's not finished, and kind of show off some prototypes and some demos and then ask for people for help. Hint, hint, by the way, if anybody wants to help us do this, we, we need it and uh, I'm fully committed. If this doesn't work out, I have to go get a job or something and that would be <laughs> terrible. So, um, have you looked at uh, Wolfram? language much? No. Because uh, this is kind of like Stephen Wolfram's project. Um, really? Which is like data semiotics, the grammar of data. Uh, and so the new Wolfram language is very similar looking to this. Yeah. Um, and they have a lot of money because it's, you know, and they have a, research, a lot of research that they do. So it, this might be an interesting project to get placed. Yeah, that's really cool. I'd like to, I'd like to hear more about that. Themselves. Yeah. Yeah. The other people who want to know about this is the Sunlight Foundation. Sunlight? Yeah. Are they for, the open? For like open data? Yeah. The thing is they have a lot of data in databases and they have a lot of people who want to manipulate that data, but most people who want to manipulate that data are not programmers. Yeah. Right. Um, well, the We're even terribly comfortable with SQL. The Sunlight Foundation though is funded by the Knight Foundation, 
um, and they don't have specific grants compared to this, though. Oh yeah. So it, it, like in theory, if it would be, no, it would be it would be more of a PR thing. True. To, to connect with them on this, but maybe a, the same would be just to go to the Knight Foundation and ask for a grant, yeah. which is what they would do for you anyway. Yeah. So there's so. Also, uh, there's another project. Um, I can't remember the name. I think Open Data Foundation or something. Yeah. ODI. Uh, the one that Max Ogden's built. Yeah, open uh, data yeah. Cool. So, so I like part of the reason why my company is totally broke is that I completely suck at this entire conversation. Like the, the the part of like going for grants and connecting with people and all that. Like I'm a coder. I'm a developer. I, uh, I, I they say there's two kinds of people: those who love money and those who love ideas. And you should never put the person who loves ideas at the front of your company. And that's exactly what we have right now. So I'm not looking to connect with anybody other than a person who, who loves money and can like take over that like, <laughs> side of the thing. Because I don't freaking care. I, like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm bad at it and I, and I don't care. Um, so any, any recommendations are, wel are welcome. And if you know anybody that's good at that, like that would be a, a blessing. Um, this is really neat. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, like you can turn on distinct here and like you see the distinct pops up. Uh, you can throw in an offset. Oh, but the thing I didn't show you is that you can change the code too. Like if I go up here and delete this, it has to redraw the whole interface, but when it does, it redraws it right, you know? Um, I change this, this two to a four and uh, you know, it puts the four down in there. And you can, you can also like create, I, I can just start typing here. Select star from meta dot table and then, oh, there finally I finally did something right and it'll take it and run with it right um, and then I throw a distinct down in here and it, po it pops in there um, and we can do this with any language there's a there's a gen general purpose pipeline by which we put in an EBNF grammar and what comes out the other side is a bunch of tables and a, and a parser and a two string that uh, that, so if you wanted to make a, like a, a kick-ass regex editor, you take the, the EBNF for regex, you dump it into the beginning of this pipeline. What you get out the other side is an abstract syntax tree for regexes in the database, a bunch of tables for, for regexes in the database, and uh, a two-string and a parser. And so then like, to make a user interface that manipulates regexes is just a matter of, of like, manipulating the structure, manipulating the... the um, the data structure that is the abstract syntax tree of regex. Does that all make sense? Kind of, kind of a, some jumping around a bit, but so anyway, um, this has been a really fun project, and we've learned a lot. But we've also learned a lot about why people don't like databases. Um, why they, why like most programs, well, like they, they don't teach them in school, which I think is absolutely absurd. But um, like, and, and then pro programmers come out the other side of school and, and don't, don't have a real good relationship with them. And there, there's a few reasons for that. And that's the, this data versioning thing I want to show you is like um, one of those reasons. It's that like, how do you do, like for source code, we've got data versioning. I mean, we've got code or what is it? Text versioning, I guess, file versioning. Um, but, and we use it all the time. But when it comes to a database, how do you do revision control on a database? And we run into this a lot, like, like, in, a, like in a CMS, right? Where um, you've got some code on the file system, and then you've got some data in your configuration system, and you try to do DevOps, right, and roll out a new release of your code, and then you gotta, oh shit, grab all that new data and figure out how to pull it in here and snapshot it and, and pull it in. And it's, it's kind of an unsolved problem as far as I know. So we've, we've uh, ran at this wall three times in three different ways. I'm gonna briefly show you those because we're pretty short on time. Um, okay. Let's start with this one. Okay. So this guy right here, what you're looking at is, uh, the first thing we did is, is make a, you know, what, you know what Fuse is? It's a thing that makes mm -hmm. file systems. Like oh, you can, it, it, it makes things look like file systems, but behind the scenes it's off doing whatever else it's doing. So uh, we made one of those for, the, for Postgres. Um, and what you see here, 
I'm just having text problems like crazy. This is, so I, I go into DB and I CD or and I LS and I, what I get a list of is all the different schemas in this database. Now these happen to, happen to be a pretty big mess, but um, let's go into widget, right? And I do LS and what I see is all the, now, now we're looking at tables. So, I, so the widget, uh, let's see, can I go into, uh, let's do this. Demo. And DT. All right, so what we have here is the tables in the widget schema. And what we have, I'm going to close all these, here is that represented as a file system. So I go into widget and I do ls, and what I see is these are all the primary keys of all the rows in the widget table. Uh, and then I'm going to, but they're directories. Then I'm going to cd into 5 and do ls. And these are all the fields in a single row of a widget. All right, so, so let's jump back over to here. Uh, and if I do slash d widget, uh, oh shoot, where are we? <coughs> Wrong database. There we go. Right, you see these fields up here. ID, name, pre.js, HTML, post.js, all that. Okay, now here they all are as the file. And if I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cat name, see what this one is called. It is called new widget. Okay, now I'm going to uh, cat, actually I already know ID. So it's called new widget right now. So I jump back over here to, uh, to this guy, and I'm going to say update widget set name equal quote, newer widget, where ID equals five. And okay, did that. So now let's cat name again. And what you see is now it's called newer widget, right? So we're, it's a bi-directional relationship. It's the, treating the database like a file. So why did we do that? Well, one, it's cool and we were just dorking around. It was super easy because this use is, is super cool to work with. But, um, but two, what it lets us do is then now we've got data in, in as files, we can just take any version control system like Git or whatever, point it at this database and say, Git add you know, this schema, and it'll just take the whole thing and dump it into a Git repository. Uh, and then you can say, you know, keep it like that and go make some data changes and say, Git stat, yeah, go ahead. One is first. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Fair it's enough, fair enough. Say it's bi-directional. So yeah. what happens, the thing is, okay, what happens, can you, VI or Emacs, whatever it is the editor you use, and actually change that value on the file system and will update within the database, or will it? Yes, let's do that. Now, now let's uh, VI name, and let's change it back to new widget, save it, and then OK. Now let's jump back over to here and select name from widget where id equals five. Whoops, wrong database. <laughs> We've all done it. Don't worry. From, at least I didn't delete it. Yeah. Where id equals five. And I got a plus in there. Oh, that's the oh, end of the thing. The so yeah, so that just, that's what just happened, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, so that's good. So I was going to say, somebody actually did the views thing before. Okay. Uh, several years ago. Yeah. But it was unidirectional. Oh, cool. As in, you could get the you could get the stuff into a file system, <coughs> but you couldn't update that. Right? Yeah. So this this is. Uh, you should open source at least this. This is pretty cool. This, this is like this is like a fifty line file. I mean, we should, we totally should open source it, but it's just I mean it's buggy as hell, and like we didn't put a ton because like <laughs> what we found out. It's dependent on you having single column primary keys. That's also very true. And that was actually one of the big issues with the original one was going to support multi column. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we totally. I mean, you know, it may be open source. I don't remember. But it's 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 a toy. You know, like if somebody wanted to run. We're we're not using it. So this is approach number. This is prototype number one. Okay. So what we didn't like about it. That's one really big important one that it, you have to have a primary key and it has to be a single primary key. Um, number two. I forget all the reasons why we didn't use it, but. Oh, right. It was, that, it was that you couldn't, it's not data. It didn't follow our first principle of, okay, well, how do I do a commit from 
you know, I have to drop back out into Git to do a commit. And we want, you know, version control to be something that the user can do. So we have to model version control as data, just like we did everything else. Um, so uh, how do you think we modeled version control as data? Let's to test the audience. What does that mean? What, what Postgres feature screams out use me when we want to model some weird thing off in the corner as data? Foreign, foreign data wrapper. Somebody said it. Um, so, so what we did is we made a git foreign data wrapper, and uh, <laughs> uh, let's, now where's this one? We have, we literally have like 24 git repositories just filled with insanity that we did over, like it's, we got to do two years of pure science and we just like tried everything we could think of. Um, okay. Whoops. That, so whoops, psql space space. That search path equal to git. Where's it git fdw? I forget. Dn. Yeah, git fdw, git. So, okay, so slash de to show our foreign tables. Okay, what we have here, so, so first let's do select star from repository. Um, and we see we've got two repositories. This is the only table in the system. And what this does is when you insert into this, uh, you like wake up a new repository that's out there on the system someplace in, in, in what this foreign data wrapper looks like. Um, so, so what you see then is we've got require.js here and I'm gonna drop back out real quick or actually open up a new one. Uh, and CD to that. And we see we've got a little repository here, Z, Z, Z. And it looks much like the one that we were looking at before, but these are actual um, files. This is just sitting on the file system. And then, okay, let's go back. Now, if I do select star from commit, what I see is all the commits. Actually, I'm gonna do, so there's 11 commits in this system and you see like author name, author email, raw message, message encoding. This is all the Git internals that we, that we then mapped to. And what it's doing, Postgres at runtime is going out and, and looking at this multi-corn foreign data wrapper um, that uses libgit2, which is the Pyth Python, or pygit2, I forget what it's called, but at, which then goes out and queries the repository and says, okay, what are all the commits? Which is basically the same thing that Git, uh, what is that, Git log does. Yeah. Um, and so, then we take that back and present it as data to the user. And, and so that means that uh, you can control a Git repository from uh, within the database using direct data manipulation. Um, okay, and then, 10 minutes? Okay, and then uh, the other piece that we did on top of this is to, to, to write the part that lets you do a commit that takes data and throws it into these blobs that are the internals of Git. If you know how Git works, it's super cool. Um, it's a, it's a, a hash database basically, where, or hash store, where everything has a hash and then that hash is the unique identifier for the file and then if that file doesn't change in a new commit, then it doesn't have to store that same file again. Um, and we learned so much about Git internals and how it all works. And anyway, we tried this out, and it's cool, and this is open source. You can get the Git foreign data wrapper. It's on Bitbucket right now, bitbucket slash aquameta. Um, and then uh, that was really cool, but we learned so much about how Git wor worked internally that we decided to uh, like start over and build our own, like basically re-implement Git in the database, which turned out to be much cleaner and much simpler, and it didn't have this kooky dependency called Git that uh, is really... You know, it's, I mean, it's a great system, it gets fine, but like we're trying to like keep everything inside the database. And, and, and they, they were forced, because they're tied to the file system, they were forced to make some decisions that were uh, less than ideal that we didn't actually have to make. So the, the third version of this is called ver, and it is actually on my local desktop here. Shoot, so is this gonna, oh, you guys aren't gonna be able to see it. 
So how many people know what Postgres.app is? It's, the, it's this cool little uh, thing that you, that it's an app for Mac, it's a, it's a dot app because it's an app for Mac that basically takes Postgres and drops it on your desktop and you get a little elephant up in the top right hand corner and, and you're, now you're running Postgres, it's super cool. And so, um, I'd love to show you that, but I can't. It's on the other screen here. Let's, I'm gonna open that. So, okay, this one is called, this. it's locally that I have yet another database that I have the uh, path equal to uh, ver, dt. And this is us implementing um, version control on our own, right? Where, where, where everything that you have in there is, uh, so this is really, I found out that there's only three operations. Uh, in 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 the database, like using our first principle, there's there's really only three things that ever happen. There's you you either you create a row, number one, you modify a field, number two, or you uh, delete a row, number three. And um, so we we boiled down everything that you need to do to just those three things, which is why we didn't need a lot of what Git. Git was doing there because, and, it, and Git treating it like a file system was really kind of making it so that you could do things that didn't make sense. Like you could make a file that was incomplete and stuff like that. So um, anyway, this is the schema for that. It's super experimental. I'm not gonna take a ton of time to demo it because I wanna open it up for, for questions. But, but what it does is it snapshots data and it uh, lets you, I mean, there's this cool Git repository just to prove that this works. Um, GitHub, that, uh, yikes, what's going on here, too many tabs, okay, let's go to Aquameta, and then let's search for widget, well, that, oh, that's a global search, come on. Go back. Widget. Widget data. Okay, so what we have here is DB. You go in there. This is a uh, <laughs> software to sell, right? Um, this is it as a Git repository. But then our, our uh, just to show you what that looks like, that it is a real Git repository. Um, but then ours doesn't use any of that, and it snapshots data, and it's, it's super alpha right now, but, but we're working on it, and we think it's going to solve some cool problems and make it so that you can do, like, modular uh, little snippets of data, um, which is basically like our, our packaging system, our, uh, our system for, for uh, packages. So, anyway, that's what we've been working on. There's a, a bunch of other stuff I didn't get a chance to show you, but uh, we're just running short on time, so let's open it up to questions. Yeah, exactly. It like uh, if you there's a there's a blob table which stores all your stuff, and when you insert into that, it also creates a hash. It first checks to see it's a it's a trigger on the table that checks to see is there already a thing that exists like this. And if there's not, then it inserts it um, and generates a hash for you. And if it, it is, then it just reuses the other one. It actually does nothing because that's that's what a that's what a blob store does, like a or, or a hash hash store does. Like you can't write the same value twice. It's just like what uh, David was talking about with the key value store. Um, how, you, how you can't have the two keys, two of the same keys, you know? Um, but it works the other way. You actually can't have two of the same values and then the keys are derived from the value. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick, some comments about your paradigm about the democratization of software. Sure. It goes back to sort of the Marx Engels paradigm. You get a good sculpture of me, I want to play really, really different results out at the end of it. And people do not have the same skills, and coders will have a lot of skill at writing code and find it very really hard to produce systems for people who don't find it easy because then it is easy. And there's a limit to how far it's worth creating a whole lot of third class developers rather than letting people do what they can do, what they need to do, yeah. and providing them with the, the, the contacts 
to get the expertise they need, but they won't have because we don't want to have the same skills, same talents, etc., to do things. That's absolutely right. The the uh, we divide what it means to be a computer scientist into like in Greek they'd call it techne, and then I forget what the other one is. But the the technical skills are one thing, and and you can master you know, know the the py, syntax of Python and how to use it, and know how to use version control, and you can you can master all these skills that 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 make you uh, able to create software and still be a completely crappy programmer. Um, and you know we see that just as, we see that all the time too. And so what we're trying to do is just take that technical side of things and make it a lot easier. But it doesn't mean you're going to be a good programmer. Like the role of computer science is still extremely relevant. And you know how far that'll take you is, you know, it's it, and there is there is an aspect. I mean I mean I believe in I'm a believer in chaos, right? And I think that creating a bunch of crappy programmers is the only way to create a bunch of really good programmers. But uh, I. I do, <laughs> But, but you don't want it on your team. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's it, you, you got to start somewhere. But um, but but I think the counter is true too. That like there's a lot of like power users who who could think like we think and do think like we think, and yet can't figure out the technical side of things. There's also a really strong argument that like um, you know the the gender divide in programming is is like 18% are women, and that number is dropping. And, and when you look at like who invented Unix and who invented Python and, and, and stuff like that, like I, I don't want to say like it, it's just interesting to observe that that like our tools I, I think do believe uh, do appeal to a certain way of thinking, um, and it's not it's certainly not you know as someone who nerds out on categorization I'm not going to be a sexist here and I don't think of it that way, but I do think it's interesting to observe that like our tools are oriented at people like that are in this room, you know, people who think in terms of, of uh, syntax and that's what appeals to them. But a lot of people are visual thinkers. A lot of people are audio thinkers. There's millions of different ways to think. And, you know, the, yet the way we create software is oriented around a single paradigm, largely, you know, with, with, with lots of exceptions, but, you know, more or less. Um, so anyway, yeah. So um, I do a lot of um, interfacing with users for software you know, as, as consultants. Yeah. Um, and actually, I found that my biggest issue with working with users on design software is that the vast majority of users can only conceive of changes as incremental changes to the software they use. Yeah. Um, that is, you know, um, that that is. I would say it's actually my single biggest problem in software design is that. I can't get the users to say, if you could have anything you want, what would you want? And they say, well, I'd like this screen to work better. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 imagine that screen wasn't there at yeah. all. What would you have in this place? Yeah. And, you, know, um, but, you know, generally speaking, that's yeah. not a lot of people are with any particular problem. I mean, if you want to really abstract it out, yeah. that you'll say, you know, people will say, well, uh, here's a great idea. Let's have world peace. Well, how do we get there? <laughs> so it starts with you. <laughs> so, so the, the the comment there is that like yeah right that that that's yet another thing that most users may not necessarily be able to they won't be able to think even if the tool tool can do what what is possible and they can use the tool they won't be able to think of you know what is possible and create software and that's another profound skill that won't, is certainly not eroded by what we're working on or, or misplaced. Or so I kind of see it as a, a gap in that in my position where I play the dual role of the business analyst and the software developer because I primarily work on business applications. I've advocated for years that businesses need to hire dedicated business analysts that can help walk through users understanding the information and data that they use to do their own business and how they do business. Because that's where people well, stumble. They don't know. We used know. to have a lot more people move that job, actually. Yeah. And, and that's been cut down right. um, because those people were expensive. Okay, so we got to wrap up. Uh, two quick, quick questions. I'll answer with a one word answer. <laughs> have you. Uh, no. <laughs> added uh, or played with QML or the dot DOM? for a DOM for web browser HTML5 in, in this database, in your database? No. So actual you, you, user interface elements have not been 
not yet, like for an actual GUI. Oh, yeah, I didn't, I'll come up afterwards, I'll show you the widget framework. It's, it's freaking bitching, it's got a debugger and it does on screen stuff, and yeah. Yeah, we worked with it. Yeah. Mine's a comment, not a question. Sure. A hundred years ago, no one would imagine that every single human being could drive a car at 70 miles an hour. Right. So making more good programmers by making lots of ordinary programmers, I think is a totally great vision. We can all drive 70 miles an hour. I would argue that we all drive 70 miles an hour. We get so much more done with everybody driving 70, and a few people can drive 140 miles an hour. That's awesome. Yeah. But you, if you bring up the level for everyone, you 